I invite you to turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, start in verse 28. If you're not sure where that is, it's the first book of the New Testament. The easiest thing to do is just look in your table of contents. If you're on your phone, it's abbreviated M-A-T-T. Chapter 21, those are the big numbers, and then beginning of verse 28. What we have here going into chapter 22 is actually a series of parables. Jesus gives three of them. So what is a parable? Well, parable comes from the Greek word parable. (laughs) And it means to throw alongside. So here's the idea. Hold hold up your hands like this if you can. Hold up your hands, okay? So now, wiggle your left hand. That's the truth. But sometimes the truth is difficult to grasp and communicate. So now your right hand is parallel we're going to tell a story that helps us understand the truth. So it's a story that's thrown alongside a truth to help us understand it. The modern term for it is sermon illustration. And that's what we have here. So Jesus uh, is going to tell some, some parables, stories that are to communicate uh, a truth, in this case particularly uh, hard truth. There are, there are a few things to note about the parables of Jesus. The first one is that when Jesus told parables, the primary reason was to confuse unbelievers. So they would not know what he's talking about. So I've had people who say, you know, really, you know, when you preach, you just ought to, you ought to tell stories because that's the way Jesus taught. I'm like, okay, well, if that's what you're going to do, if you're just going to tell stories, make sure you tell stories that non-Christians have no idea what you're talking about. If you want to tell them like Jesus did. Now, why would Jesus do that? Because Most of the parables of Jesus came towards the end of his ministry. And at this point, there was already opposition to him. So Jesus, it's not time yet for him to die. He's got more than he needs to teach and tell his disciples. So he tells parables so that the unbelievers will not understand what he's saying, for the most part, so that it will delay their bringing about his execution when it's the time that God had appointed. And so he speaks in parables that way. The second thing about parables is they relate to salvation. They're not about spiritual growth or prayer. And the parables are primarily directed at the concept of salvation. And that's certainly true with the three that we see today. And so Jesus is going to give all three of these parables. And all of them relate to the question of who belongs. Who belongs to the family of God? Who belongs to the kingdom of God? Who belongs to God? Who belongs uh, to his covenant people? Who's going to belong in heaven? All those ideas, all these are about who belongs. So let's look at the first one. The first one is the parable of the two sons. So what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, many of the people that were listening, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Now, in all likelihood, these sons are older. Now, we know they're old enough to work in the vineyard. But let's be honest, if we're talking like 11, 12, 13, and they say no to dad, this parable is going in a different direction. Uh, This is the go to your room parable. So probably these are adult sons, the fact that they could say no. Uh, And so your son goes where he says no, but afterward he changes his mind, he goes and works. And then the other son, he says, I'll go dad. Uh, crosses his fingers and eyes, but he doesn't do it. So Jesus asked the question, which did the will of his father? Now the answer is obvious, is it not? It's not what you say, but it's your actions. It's what we're saying. So, well, the first. But then Jesus is going to drive home the message. He says, so truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go in the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God before you. Now let's talk about what in the world are tax collectors? Well, <clears throat> Let us say a couple things first of all. I don't suppose there's any place on the entire planet where people really like tax collectors. I mean, most people are not real big fans of the IRS. We have a lifelong family friend that worked for the IRS for years. When people say, what do you do for a living? I have a government job. I mean, he understood. I mean, we understand 
this is, this is the reality. People don't like folks that tax, collect taxes, but this is far more serious and, and, and worse than that because the way the Romans did it was they hired locals to collect taxes from locals. So these tax collectors are actually Jews who are working for the Roman government to collect, tax, to collect taxes from other Jews. However, the way that worked was that they normally they worked these toll booths where they would, the people had to pay a toll to do something or go somewhere and that's why they collect their taxes. The Roman government would say, okay, this month you need to collect X number of dollars in taxes. So what the tax collectors would do is they would raise the rates and everything above what the Roman government said they wanted, this person got to keep. So what do we have? We have Jews who are collecting taxes from Jews working for the Roman government, so they're viewed as traitors. But only traitors, they're collecting more taxes than they're supposed to to line their own pockets. So we have traitors who are crooks. Well, it's no wonder they're not liked. So what does Jesus say? He says, well, you know, here we have the, the, the religious leaders who say all the right things, who act all the right way, who dress all the right way, who behave all the right way. You know, they've got all of that together, but they're not really in the kingdom. Instead, Jesus says tax collectors and prostitutes. Now, I'm not going to attempt to explain to you what a prostitute is. I assume you know. If you don't know, it's probably good for you. Um, so we have tax collectors and prostitutes. He says, these people, now, we're going now, now, why in the world would they get into the kingdom ahead of those people who are religiously committed? Here's the reason. The parable. What Jesus is saying is we have people who think they're right with God, who say they're right with God, but they are not. On the other hand, we have people who know they're not right with God. They're tax collectors and prostitutes. But when they hear the message of the righteousness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, they repent of their life and now are a new person in Christ. And so those are the people that said no, but now they're actually doing what, what God wants them to do. So here's what he's saying, that, that there are people who think they belong, but they're wrong. They don't belong. They say it, but they're not right. And he's addressing particularly the religious leaders. And we have, look, there are people that you learn all the right things to say, how to behave. You know, you learn how to, pray before the meal Lord please bless the food and the hands that prepared it I and mean, we've got all these you can learn all these phrases that you're supposed to pray at the right times and so and that's what they do they got all of it down but it's not it's not real it's not genuine so here's kind of the way let me give you a parable sermon illustration I fly I fly a lot um, and uh, some years I fly a whole lot <clears throat> but I fly a good deal so I'm in and out of airports pretty regularly so I see a lot of things but here's one of the things I see with astounding regularity they're standing in front of the metal detector and the TSA agent says do you have any metal on you no and then they give them a list keys change no I don't have any metal on me they step up and the buzzer goes off and so now they have to wand them and so it's really interesting if you're a a man, they have a man wand you. If they have a woman, they have a woman wand you. Which means our government recognizes two genders. <laughs> and so they wand you, and then you see people, and this is what really shocks me. Not that there were like three pennies in their pocket that's off the metal detector. They're like pulling out. They got keys. They just ask you, keys? No. <laughs> Change? No. And then there's pulling it all, they're, they're pulling all this out. And then and when you get the people to do the body scanner, you know, think we got to stand like this for three seconds. And they ask, do you have anything in your pockets? No. You nothing in your pocket. You can't have anything in your pockets. You got nothing. You don't have anything in my pockets. They step up. They got, they got stuff in their pockets. Now, <clears throat> because we have an overreaching government, I can't, the place where I just can't be myself anymore. And this is one of those. Because when I'm asked, do you have anything in your pockets? What I want to say is yes. Would you remove it? Yes. And start pulling lint out of my, that's just kind of the way, I mean, it's not. <laughs> or else I'm just not normal but anyway and so you see so here's what Jesus is saying we're going to get to the metal detector the scanner of heaven and Jesus is going to say do you have sin and they're going to be people who say no because they think they've done more good than bad and that's canceled it out no and then they're going to get scanned 
and they're going to have sin and they're not going to be allowed into heaven. Because get into heaven, all your sin has to be gone. And there's only one way for that to happen and that is to put it all on Jesus Christ. He died to take away all of our sin so that when we are scanned, we are clean. So don't say, oh yeah, well I got it all together. Oh yeah, I, 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 I've gone to church my whole life. I've done this. I've never done this bad thing and that bad thing and that other bad thing. Trust me, your pockets are full of iniquity if you've never given them to Jesus Christ. And so this is the, the first parable he gives about belonging. Then the second one, the parable of the tenants, beginning verse 33. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants. He went into another country. Now when the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Now, there are a number of steps that, that you take if you're going to have there. The first one is you got to plant the vineyard. That makes sense. Then you put a fence around it. What's the purpose of the fence? To keep wild animals out of it. But only you have to worry about wild animals, you got to worry about thieves. And so you would put a tower in it. Now, the fence you want to have there all the time because animals will come at any time. But thieves typically are only going to arrive at the vineyard when it's harvest time when there's fruit on the vines. And so you would hire out people to man the tower during those times. And of course, he is expecting results because he builds a wine press. That's where you squeeze out all the grape juice and everything. And so he's done all of this and then he, he hires out some, some people to work it for him. He leased it to tenants and goes into another country. Now it's time for him to go and collect the fruits of his vineyard. So he's, he... He sends these servants and they beat them and kill them in stone. Now, who in the world are these servants? Who's, remember, he's Jesus a parable. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the prophets that God sent as messengers to his people. But what did they do? They rejected them. And then they just rejected them at one time. They rejected them over and over and over again throughout history. That's why he says in verse 36, they again sent other servants more than the first. And they did the same to them. So if you read the prophets of the Old Testament, they're, they're stoned, jailed, uh, beaten, killed, rejected, despised. Uh, my, my personal favorite is Jeremiah. I, I teach Old Testament. My area of specialty is the prophets and in particular the book of Jeremiah. So anybody ever says, you're a pastor, an expert, or anything, you tell them, yeah, the book of Jeremiah. It's awesome. Now, Jeremiah, it's, I, I admire him. He's just one of my top characters in the Bible because God called him to preach for 50 years and told him ahead of time, you'll have no converts. You'll have nobody listen to your message. They're going to reject you. They're going to hate you. They're not going to listen to you. I, mean, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't call that an encouraging call to the ministry. <clears throat> Jeremiah was beaten, put into prison, thrown into a pit. After much of what he had predicted came true, they said, you know what? We think you might be a true prophet from God. So what do you think we need to do next? He said, stay here. So they kidnapped him and took him to Egypt. <laughs> it's like, I mean, just, and, and remember like Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because of how difficult his life and his ministry was. And so God sent these, these messengers, but they rejected them. But notice, he finally, verse 37, sends his son. Of course, this is a reference to Jesus. It's a reference to Christ, the son of God. And, and he sent him and they said, man, let's get rid of this one as well. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So what in the world is the owner of the vineyard going to do? And they go, well, you know what? He's going to seek his vengeance. And so Jesus now quotes from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23 about this cornerstone that's been rejected 
by God's people. So the Jews have rejected Jesus and so now others are going to be. So notice two things that are a result of this. The first one is verse 43. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. In other words, these religious leaders thought we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have the temple. We have the covenants. We have the command. We have all of this. We're guaranteed heaven. They started every day praying by thanking God that they were not a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. Their prayer, not mine. But they thought, I'm in automatically. And Jesus says, no, that is not the case. Now I want you to, to listen to me very carefully and understand what I'm saying. Our country throughout the majority of its history has been intimately interwoven with some fundamental concepts of Christianity. We've never been a Christian nation in the sense that's an official religion or that there have been more people that are Christians than not. But if you look at our nation historically, Christianity has been the dominant religion of our nation. And God has blessed us tremendously. And we have taken that and we have used it to bless the nations. The United States has sent more missionaries in its short history than any other nation in all the history of mankind to spread the good news of Jesus around the world. But God has not blessed us for ourselves. God has blessed us to be a blessing to others. But understand, being a Christian is not a birthright. It is not a family heritage. It is not guaranteed to us, nor are the blessings of God. God, at his own discretion, can say, you know what? I'm tired of your faithlessness. I'm tired of your doubt. I'm tired of your selfishness. I'm tired of all this. I'm going to move on down the road and I'm going to use somebody else. God does not need us. And if God chooses, he can move on somewhere else. The United States is no longer the center of Christianity on our planet. That honor now belongs to South Korea, which has the highest percentage of Christians of any country in the world. They're sending missionaries all around the globe. I'm telling you, God does not say, well, because you were raised American, then it's all right. I owe you something. That is not the way that it works. This is why we pray so desperately and so regularly for a great spiritual awakening. We do not want God to move down the road and replace us. We want God to use us to bless the nations. We want God to change people's lives where we're at. We want to see God at work in our world where we live and around the globe where we do not. And so he warns them, you think you're in, but I can take it and give it to someone else. And the rest of the New Testament is basically the history of God taking it and using other people rather than them. And then the second thing is this verse 44, this breaking stone business. Some people will be broken on it and then others will be broken by it when it falls on them. So what's the difference? Well, the ones who are broken on it are those who have heard the message of Jesus, have listened to it, have thought about it, have weighed it, but have rejected it. They know it. They could probably present the gospel as well as a believer could, but they have rejected as the truth. They will be broken on this stone when they stand before God because they've rejected his truth. But then there are those that the stone falls on. Those are people who don't want to hear it. You go to share with them about Jesus. I don't want to hear all that. Keep that religious stuff to yourself. I don't need that. They have ignored Jesus. They've ignored the good news. They've ignored the Bible. They've ignored our message. In the end, both are broken. Whether they have rejected it or whether they have ignored it, in the end, they are both broken. Now, verse 45 and 46, they realize, hey, wait a minute, he's talking about us. See, the Pharisees have said, we belong, we belong, we belong, we're in, we're in, we're in, we're in. Look at us. We're, we, we live so righteously and so godly and so all of this and, and we should impress everybody and everybody should want to be like us and we're in and the rest of you are out. And what Jesus is saying is, no, it's not that way. You are the ones who are not in those you didn't expect. It's kind of like this. You know, there are a lot of places you go that you have like a lanyard. In you. Like you have a, some of you work at a place, you got like someone a swipe card or you wave it in front of something and, and you don't get access without your swipe card. You, you don't get in. The Pharisees were walking around saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm telling you to get into heaven. 
Your goodness is the wrong swipe card. It does not gain you access. The only way in is if your swipe card says you belong to Jesus Christ. That you've put your faith in him to forgive you and to cleanse you and to make you right. You say, well, man, I, I've, I've, I've had such a, a rough life. I've committed all kinds of sin and everything. It doesn't matter. Your past is not ma all matter. All that matters is, do you belong to Jesus? And there are people who think they belong because they've lived a certain way or they've learned the right phrases or they were raised in church or whatever it is that, are, that don't belong. The only way in is if you have the card with Jesus' name. And then in chapter 22, we get the third parable. The parable of the wedding feast. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He sent servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Man, it's gonna be a barbecue. It's gonna be great. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm and other to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now the story's pretty straightforward. We have the wedding feast. We invite all these people, but none of them show up. They all go somewhere else. Matter of fact, some of them seized the servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. So, Act 2, verse 8, I like this. The food's ready. The banquet's ready, but there's nobody here. Man, if we got the food, we need to eat. All right, come on now. We got the food, we need to eat. And so he says, look, go out and find people. Wherever you find us, get them and bring them to the wedding feast. So they come. Now, these people were not prepared. They were not invited. They weren't ready. So they don't have their wedding clothes on. So probably what's happened is as people come, the, the, the king has, the you servants know, have provided people with some kind of robe so that they'll look okay at the wedding. I mean, let's be honest. If I was one of those and they went and snagged me out of Walmart, and when I go to Walmart, I ain't wearing the same thing I wear at a wedding. Especially if it's July. And so they, they, they go and they get them. And so, so they all, they're all there. They belong. But then verse 11, he sees this one who doesn't have the wedding garment. So how in the world did you get in here without it? He's speechless. So they take him out in the outer darkness. Now you may be thinking, well, that's a pretty brutal punishment for not wearing the right robe. Okay, remember this is a parable. It's not actually how you treat wedding guests. <laughs> it's a parable. And, and Jesus is wanting to, to drive home this point that this person thought he was in but he didn't belong had the wrong garment on and so they sent him into the outer darkness there is a punishment for our disobedience to God it's called the outer darkness the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth it's called hell Hades Gehenna uh, the, the pit of fire and brimstone it, it goes by a number of different descriptions in the, the, the Bible but it's a place where we pay the punishment for our breaking of God's law, for our sin. So then that raises the question, how long then is this punishment? Well, if God is infinitely holy, then any sin against him is infinitely evil, which will require an infinite punishment. So that's why the Bible describes hell as a place of forever because it will take infinity to pay the punishment of your sin. You say, well, I've, I've, I've broken God's law. And if you say you haven't broken God's law, well, you have now. The lion's one of them. <clears throat> say, so how can I then get into heaven? Well, somebody has to pay this punishment. If it's not going to be you, it's got to be somebody that does it for you. And this is why Jesus died on the cross. So watch how this works. An infinitely holy God against whom every sin is infinitely evil. There needs to be an infinite payment. So the infinitely holy God sends his infinitely holy son, Jesus, to die on the cross to take 
in himself an infinite punishment for my sin so that I might spend infinity with an infinitely holy God in heaven. And so he says this, this one, he, he, he doesn't belong. He's cast out. So then verse 14, many are called, many are invited, but few are chosen. You may think you're in, but you're not. Only those that, that, that God has chosen. So here's kind of what he's getting at here. He's talking about going into the roads and, the, and finding them and everything. It's always astounding to me when road conditions are poor, how many people still drive stupidly, foolishly. They drive at unsafe speeds for road conditions. So here's what Jesus is saying. The road to heaven is impossibly difficult. You and I cannot get there driving ourselves. But the good news is Jesus is in a snow plow. He says, hop on and I will take you there myself. And so those who belong are not those who are great and awesome and wonderful and have all the religious stuff down together. It's those who belong to Jesus. It's those who have recognized their sin and confessed it to him and have been forgiven by him. <clears throat> Let me see if I can help us understand how all three of these parables, what they're saying. I like to, look, we live in the state with the Grand Canyon in my opinion, most beautiful uh, places in the whole wide world. And so several times a year, I like to go up to Grand Canyon and, and sometimes I'll just go up and make a quick hike to the river and back and come home. And I just love, it's just a lot of fun. I really like going to Grand Canyon. So a few years ago, I was, I'd gone up uh, to spend a day and, it, and I'd finished hiking down the river and back. And, and I'm just kind of relaxing, enjoying a little time, you know, there on the rim and looking out over the Grand Canyon. Just think about how huge this thing is and how it reflects the vastness and the bigness and the glory of our God. And a tour bus pulls up. And about 50 Chinese tourists all get off this bus. So they're all looking over the ramp, taking pictures, and all which everybody does. I mean, this is where you go is look at it, take pictures. And then the tour guide, you always spot them. They got the little pole with a flag thing on top. Gets all their attention, has them all turn around. Because the tour guide is going to take a picture of the group with the Grand Canyon in the background. Now it's me. So they're all lined up and thinking, okay, nobody's going to step back because there's a big ditch behind them. So I guess whenever they got back wherever they were from and started looking at pictures, <laughs> somebody said, who's that bald white dude with us? Because <laughs> I just stepped up in the, behind the group and, <laughs> and just, you know, like photobombed them. I, and it's just, why would not? And uh, so, <laughs> so here's the thing. To be a part of the picture of people in heaven, you have to belong. You might really, look, you can be in the picture, but you don't belong. See, I was, I was in the picture, but I didn't belong. I wasn't a part of them. And there are people who think, oh, if I'm just in the picture, I'm good. If I've just gone to church some, I've done some good stuff or, or whatever, that, that I belong. No, the only way you belong is if you belong to Jesus Christ. And the only way that happens is by confessing that you are a sinner in need of someone to forgive you and pay the penalty for your sin against God. And this is what makes us belong. It doesn't matter what your background is, whether you're a tax collector, prostitute or whatever, it does not matter. Those belong who belong to Jesus. And those who do not belong to him do not belong, even if they stick their face in the picture. So Jesus is wanting to drive this point home because there were people who thought they belonged. Now, listen to me carefully. Just because you were raised in a Christian home and raised to go to church and you know stuff about the Bible, maybe you've even served on committees and, and served as an usher and done all kinds of stuff in church and all that, that doesn't get you there. There's only one thing that gets you there and that is Jesus. These are people who had done all that stuff and more and Jesus says you don't belong. That's not what gets us in. Saying yes, I've done it, is not what gets us in. Doing what God wants is what gets us in. And what God says is you have to put your faith in Jesus. That's what makes us belong.